Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, here tonight for the second in this year's series of Leon Levy Foundation lectures on Jewish material culture. Uh, in particular, I'd like to welcome all of you sitting in this room on West 86th Street, those of you watching around the world and potentially in the future uh, on BGC TV, and to acknowledge uh, to you and to the future that the Bard Graduate Center uh, and its intellectual life unfolds on the ancestral homelands of the Leni Lenape peoples. We began last week uh, with an introduction to the concept of Jewish archaeology with its historiography starting in uh, 1926, both in, uh, in print with the publication by the Hungarian scholar uh, Ludwig Blau and in Palestine with the work of Eliezer Sukenik. And we continue the story um, onward through the 20th century today in the second lecture. And it's an opportunity to consider the, uh, the Wittgensteinian problem of language, the category itself of Jewish archaeology, both of those words, insofar as they relate to artifacts found in the ground, are problematic, not nearly as straightforward as they might seem. And it is to uh, the unraveling of that riddle that uh, today's lecture and next Tuesday night's lecture will be devoted. So it's my great pleasure to invite um, Zev Weiss to continue. And for those of you who were not here last week, uh, Professor Weiss is the Eliezer Sukanik Professor of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, from which he received all of his degrees, BA, MA, and PhD. He's been a visiting professor at Princeton, uh, at the Maison Méditerranéenne des Sciences de l'Homme in Aix, at the École Pratique des Hautes Études uh, in Paris, a visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World just across the park. And it's a pleasure to acknowledge the presence here in the audience of the founding director of ISA. Um, since 1990, he's been uh, the director of the dig at Sephoris, at Sephori in northern Israel, has published extensively on Sephori, the Sephora Synagogue, uh, which won the Le uh, Levi Sala Book Prize in the Archaeology of Israel. He's published on the mosaics in the House of Dionysus at Sephoris, and in 2014, published with Harvard University Press, uh, Public Spectacles in Roman and Late Antique Palestine. Uh, he's had many students, 13 MA students and 10 doctoral students, and we uh, are fortunate this semester and these three weeks to be also his students at these lectures. And so it's my pleasure to welcome Zev Weiss to the podium. Thank you, Peter, again for the warm introduction. I also welcome everybody in the audience who came for the second lecture. Archaeology and archaeological research gained momentum in the first two decades following the establishment of the State of Israel, playing an important role in shaping national identity and in supporting Jewish claims to return to their homeland. These years were the golden age of Israeli archaeology at a time when volunteers participated in some of the major excavations, when annual conferences drew large audiences, and when the media covered important discoveries extensively. At this time, the Department of Antiquities and Museums, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and the Israel Exploration Society collaborated with each other on some projects with common goal of uncovering the history of the land of Israel through archaeology. But it was the Hebrew University, but the Department of Archaeology, the Hebrew University, that played a pivotal role in shaping the fields of research and archaeological activity in the early days of the State of Israel. However, Following the death of Eleazar Lipa Sukenik in 1953, and under the leadership of Benjamin Mazar, later on Yigal Yadin, the emphasis shifted from Jewish archaeology generally to biblical archaeology with a broadened purview of the ancient Near East. This was applied to the curriculum of the Department of Archaeology, 
for the faculty's research interests and publications, and mainly to the archaeological projects conducted at the time. Benjamin Mazar excavated at Tel Kassila, Tel Aviv, between 1948 and 1950, and Yohanan Aaroni dug in Ramat Rachel, Jerusalem, in, a, in collaboration with La Sapienza, Rome, between 1959 and 1962. But it was Igael Yadin's extensive excavations in the late 50s and 50s at Chatzor, at the Upper Galilee, and then at Megiddo in northern Israel, the two biblical sites that provided first-hand information about the Canaanite cities, the Israel conquest of Canaan, and the administrative center under kingship of Solomon, attracted much attention both in Israel and abroad. Other archaeological wo archaeologists working at the Department of Antiquities at this time conducted excavation at other biblical sites, mainly in the 60s. Moshe Dotan excavated at Ashdod, Ruth Amiran excavated at, uh, in Arad, and the American project under the auspices of the Hebrew Union College and the Harvard Semitic Museum was initiated in 1964 at Gezer. The important discoveries generated a great deal of interest in biblical archaeology and provided Israeli society with historical and ideological justification for the establishment of the young state. Jewish archaeology was now just one topic among many in the curriculum and research of the Hebrew University Department of Archaeology. It is interesting to note, however, that some of the projects conducted during the first two decades following the establishment of the State of Israel, a few of which received unprecedented national and international attention, were associated with Jewish realm in the late Second Temple period and the first centuries of the Common Era. The most important one conducted in those years, beginning with the leadership of Eleazar Sukenik and followed by his son, Igael Yadin, was the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which became a, wash a watershed in the study of Hebrew literature and Jewish archaeology. Several excavations were initiated by the Hebrew University faculty members. Nachman Avigad resumed the excavations at Bet Shearim that were first conducted by Benjamin Mazar on behalf of the Israel Exploration Society in 1936 and 1940, and Michaela Viona uncovered the synagogue at Caesarea Maritima, whose remains were first identified in 1932. Other projects were conducted by the Department of Antiquities at Korazim and Hamad Tiberias, for example, as part of the program to develop and promote sites for tourism and salvage excavations were initiated following the accident, accidental exposure of archaeological remains such as Jason tomb in Hasmonea and Pir Jerusalem and the synagogue at Maon Yerim in southern Israel. But the most important development associated with Jewish realm is connected to the excavations Igael Yadin conducted in Judean Desert. In 1960-61, he uncovered the spectacular remains of Bar Kokhba rebels at Nachal Hever, who fought against the Romans between 135 and 132 to 135, including the letters the revolt's leader, Bar Kokhba, wrote to the subordinates at Engedi. And from 1963 to 1965, Yadin conducted the largest and most complex excavation at that time, at Masada, where he uncovered King's, King Herod's early first century BC fortress palace, as well as the remains of the living quarters of the Jewish rebels against Rome. These rebels, known as Sikari or Zilats, who according to Yadin's interpretation, fought the, the final battle of the first revolt in, at the site in 73 CE. Beside the discovery and study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, each excavation revealed new and previously unknown data about the customs and daily life of the Jews of ancient Palestine. For example, 
the Bet Yerim necropolis yielded an abundance of architectural, epigraphic, and artistic finds that shed light on many aspects of Jewish life in late antique Palestine. The survey and excavation at Korazim provided first-hand information regarding the construction and layout of Jewish village and the relationship between private space and the local synagogue in rural Galilee. The synagogue at Hamat Tiberias with its colorful mosaic floor and striking, striking zodiac in its center is associated with the patriarchal circles living in fourth century Tiberias. With the exception of Irving Goodenough's monumental work, which focuses on the significance of Jewish symbols in the Greco-Roman world and attests what he believed was the growing power of Jewish mysticism that opposed Rabbinic Judaism, the discourse at the time focused primarily on isolated finds or individual settlements. However, for all their importance, their data were insufficient to generate broad discussions on the implications of Jewish material culture. In contrast, the assortment of finds associated with the Sicari or Zealots at Masada, or those belong to Bar Kokhba followers who fled to Nachal Hever, provided data that shed new light on Jewish life and customs in the, Jew in the Second Temple period and between the two revolts against Rome. These finds, utensils and storage, uh, and storage containers, clothing and footwear, cosmetic and perfume accessories, exhibit the daily life, food preparation, and cultural behavior at the time, whereas the written documents, including legal contracts, are expressions of Jewish, of Jews' religious behavior and their observance of Jewish law, such as keeping the Sabbath, giving tithes to priests and the poor, and, va and waving the four species during the Feast of Tabernacles, known also as Sukkot. The information had been retrieved at both sides is of exceptional quality. However, beside Herod's fortress palace at Masada, most of the evidence focuses on the precise time frame and fairly defined population group in the late Second Temple period and between the two revolts. A notable change took place in the final decades of the 20th century after the 1967 war with the expansion of borders, increased interest in the state of Israel, economic prosperity, and mainly the massive development of the country in the years that followed. Archaeology had now gained significant momentum, attracting local and foreign expeditions, as well as students and volunteers interested in uncovering the early history of the cultures living in the region through abundant artifacts in the hidden underground. Excavation also yielded abundant information about Jewish life in ancient Palestine and contributed significantly, not only to the fields in which Sukenik was engaged, but expanded also the scope of cultural markers for Jewish ethnic and religious identity. Social cultural markers for Jewish presence have been found at many sites in both private pub and public spheres and are evident not only in the major towns and cities of ancient Palestine, in the heart of the Jewish community and in rabbinic circles where some of the literary works show, uh, uh, known to date were uh, composed, but also at remote sites and in marginal areas. In what follows, I will discuss the major innovations in the study of Jewish material culture in the final decades of the 20th century and in current research, starting with burial customs and ancient synagogues, the two ta major topics in Sukenik's research, and continue with ritual busts, stone vessels, and some domestic wares. Our knowledge of Jewish burial practices in the late Second Temple period comes primarily from the many burial places uncovered in Jerusalem 
and its environs, as well as insights in Judea and Samaria, from which it is possible to learn about the types of tombs and their decoration, burial practices, and the location of the necropolis on the outskirts of the city. Compared to other burial sites, the Jerusalem necropolis is outstanding. Over a thousand burial tombs and close to 3,000 uh, 3, ossuaries, of which 1,200 are decorated, and a corpus of close to 600 inscriptions in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew are known to date in, in the local necropolis that lies, that lies mostly to the north, east, and south of the city, and the map showing the distribution of those uh, uh, um, burial tombs around the city. The finds corroborate Sukhenik's insights on the subject, but also add new and more comprehensive information that was known in his day. Primary, bur uh, primary burials in the late Second Temple period, for the most part situated on, on the family estate in rock-cut caves containing kuchim, but it turns out that in the last decades before the destruction of the temple, a new burial method was introduced in Jerusalem, that's on the right, whereby the disease was buried inside single acosolio, which is an arch recess carved into the cave's walls. The poor buried their dead in the ground, and the wealthy at the th at time used stone sarcophagi placed in large and sumptuous burial caves. It also became evident that the custom of collecting bones in stone arteries was introduced in Judea in the late first century BCE, and several theories raised over the years attempt to find the meaning of this practice. The assorted finds uncovered in Jerusalem necropolis have enriched our knowledge of the prevalent funerary art at the time, what it is also known that the various motives decorating tomb facades, sarcophagi, and arteries in, um, uh, uh, find expression in other contemporary buildings and monuments in the city. It appears that the local artists drew their inspiration, especially in the Greco-Roman culture, but avoided figurative images in favor of neutral motives comprising mainly geometrical and stylized floral designs. The finds from the Galilean necropolis attest to the burial custom practiced by the Jews in the first century CE, after the destruction of the temple. Among all the sites documented in the region until the late 1960s, the necropolis in Beit Sharim, which was thoroughly excavated in the 1930s and 1950s, provide the greatest amount of information about Jewish burial practices in the Galilee in antiquity. Since then, hundreds of burial places have been discovered on the outskirts of villages, towns, and cities throughout the Galilee, where several are dated to the late Second Temple period, but the majority were in use in Roman and Byzantine times. At, at some sites, a single tomb is noted and at other, cluster of burial caves are located in several areas on the outskirts of a city or village. Primary burials in the Galilee, for the most part, in rock-cut caves containing kuchim or multiple arcosolia, but are less prevalent, prevalent in mausolea. Some bury their dead directly in the earth or in wooden or stone sarcophagi, as well as in marble sarcophagi, and in lead and clay coffins that were introduced into the region in the third and fourth centuries CE. In most cases, burial customs uh, um, in the Galilee continued tradition practice in the Jerusalem and late, in the late second temple period, including secondary bone coll uh, uh, coll uh, uh, collection, solegium, whereby the bones were arranged in small niches carved in the tomb's wall or in stone clay arteries and those are on the left over there. Compared to what has been found in Jerusalem, the Galilean counterparts are of poorer decoration and lower quality. The profile 
of the Bet Shearim necropolis is very different from the late Second Temple period necropolis in Jerusalem, and it's also quite different from what existed in Roman and late Antique Galilee. Although the excavations were completed several decades ago, and the finds have subsequently been published, the Becherim necropolis is still generating discussion and providing new insight in current scholarship. Elaborate catacombs branching in several directions were hewn into the rock, each containing several burial holes usually arranged around the central courtyard, as we can see here on the plan on the uh, left. For the most part, burial and Becherim followed patterns known elsewhere in the Galilee. However, preference was given here for burial in Archisolia and not Kuchim. The many burial inscriptions in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek provide valuable information about the interred, including their occupations, role of the, in the community, titles, and family ties. A variety of artistic depictions embellish the necropolis, some appearance for the first time in Jewish art. Jewish symbols, figurative in images, and even mythological themes decorated catacombs facade, interior walls, and coffins. Necropolis of similar magnitude have not yet been excavated in Jewish Galilee. And although the finds known today from Sepphoris in Tiberias necropolis, they are sparse and inferior in quality and quantity to those from Bet Shearim. They nevertheless attest to the size, scale, and splendor of the necropolis in both cities. The urban elite in these two major Galilean cities supposedly built their burial places in the spirit of the time and were probably no less beautiful, upland, and grandiose than the patriarchal burial place in Bet Shearim. The finds uncovered in the last decades of the 20th century and until today in both Judea and the Galilee add further layers to Sukhanic insights and indeed refine certain paradigms concerning Jewish burial customs, but also enable us, above all, to, exam to examine a single social cultural phenomena over time from the late Second Temple period and throughout late antiquity. Some attest to the continuity of certain Jewish customs from one period to the next, while others point to new elements introduced into the Jewish necropolis at a later stage and were mainly influenced by the surrounding Greco-Roman culture. The synagogue was a central institution of Jewish community in ancient Palestine, the diaspora. To date, over a hundred synagogues are known to have existed in ancient Palestine, either through the excavation of an entire building or the detection of even a single component from one, be it an inscription, architectural element, or, the, or artistic find. And the frieze from Ashkelon at the bottom of the screen is ex a good example for that. The earliest excavated synagogue building dates to the end of the second temple period. But after the destruction of the uh, Jerusalem temple, and especially from the third century CE on, the synagogue underwent radical changes in both form and content. Many synagogues have been excavated since Sukhanik's day, mainly in the latter decades of the 20th century, and some even more recently. They were uncovered mainly by Israeli archaeologists, but also by American and German expeditions or the Christian Franciscan order. Excavations were carried out primarily in the Galilee and the Golan, but also in the Jordan Valley, the southern Judea hills and coastal area. The abundance of archaeological finds have enhanced our understanding of Jewish institutions from the Second Temple period throughout late antiquity and also generated new methods of research and has provided important insights into the study of the ancient synagogue. The scope of discussion on this central institution is broad and varied, encompassing art, 
architecture, internal furniture, liturgy, and inscriptions revealing information about the donors and donations, communal leaders, chronology, and more. Although there are still quite a few unresolved issues and disagreement in current research, great strides have undoubtedly been made in this field in the last decades. One of the greatest significant innovation in the study of ancient synagogue was the discovery of several communal buildings that functioned in the late second temple period while the Jerusalem temple still stood. According to Sukeni, the Theotokos inscriptions uncovered in the city of David in 1913, and that's on screen, was the earliest testimony of a synagogue in ancient Palestine. However, Owing to the lack of structural evidence at the time, it could not visualize the architectural layout or interior space of this building. Several Second Temple period synagogues are known to date. Masada, Herodium, Mudi'in, and Kiryat Sefer in Judea, Gamla in the Golan, and more recently at Magdala in the Galilee. That's the image on the right. The interior space of these late second temple synagogues with their rectangular plans and dissimilar orientation contain columns to support the roof and step benches for, uh, for sitting along the wall. An arrangement that facilitated communal participation in the activities con conducted inside the building. Several of these uh, synagogues also had annex room, water installation, adjacent ritual baths, and other facilities of uncertain identification. The Galilean and Golan synagogues had yet another feature that was barely known at the other sites, the use of artistic decorations in the main hall. The synagogue at Gamla on left was graced with architectural features carved in relief, and at Magdala, in addition to the ornamented shallow stone table, on which the scrolls were placed before and after the reading of the scriptures, that's at the top, the building was decorated with frescoes and at least on its eastern aisle was paved with geometric mosaic. Contrary to the opinion prevalent in the 20th century that the typological division of ancient synagogues into three groups is also a chronological one, it is now clear that the diversity is what ultimately characterized um, the architecture of synagogues constructed after the destruction of the temple and from the third century throughout late antiquity. Several basic principles guided the plan of the building as a place of prayer and cult, but these were applied independently in each locale. Synagogue ornamentation varied in both subject matter and artistic quality. The exterior walls of the monumental synagogues in the Galilee Golan, those are at the, at the top, whose date is still debatable among scholars were embellished with decorative elements that followed the popular decorative style in, the, in Roman Syria. Whereas most uh, synagogue buildings focused their attention on beautifying the inner space of prayer hall with colorful mosaics according to the late antique tradition. And the two examples from Bet Alpha and Hamat Tiberias represent this group of building. Thus, motives inspired by Greco-Roman and early Christian iconographic traditions were now introduced into synagogue art, de developing a different pace from place to place of, and from one community to the next were already noticeable in Roman period, intensifying significantly in course of late antiquity. The study of ancient synagogues was especially enriched by the discovery of several buildings decorated with colorful mosaics featuring figurative images, such as those at Engedi, Gaza, Susia, Seferis, Hovat Hamam, and more recently, Chukok. These synagogues provide new insights regarding the layout of mosaic carpets featuring figurative images, Jewish symbols, and mainly the portrayal of biblical scenes and the incorporation of the zodiac at more than a few sites. 
The number of biblical sins is, n is not particularly large, and although the sins vary from one place to the next, they include a, a range of motives from biblical uh, from the books of Genesis, Exodus, Number, Judges, 1 Samuel, Isaiah, Jonah, and Daniel. Several theories have been suggested over the years for the inclusion of synagogue floors, from the meaning of a single sin to the programmatic use of biblical themes embedded in one mosaic from a wider perspective. Although each of these proposals can be equally persuasive and problematic, the growing number of biblical scenes that have been uncovered in synagogue art and their distribution throughout the region may allude to an even wider practice among the Jews of antiquity to decorate their prayer halls with such scenes. And in contrast to the Christian realm, was not considered inappropriate to appear on the synagogue floor. Alongside the biblical scenes was the zodiac, which was incorporated into the floors of eight synagogues. Despite the iconographic and stylistic differences in the design of each side, at each side, the motive in its basic layout remained unchanged. Owing to its larger size, this pagan motive occupied a considerable part of the mosaic floor and undoubtedly became the focus of attention. However, its exact meaning in these Jewish circles is elusive and therefore debatable. Without going into details and meaning of this motive, the, its inclusion in several ancient synagogues is indicative and its importance in the eyes of the Jewish community despite its pagan regions. Other finds uncovered over the years provide important information relating to the crystallization of synagogue liturgy and the accompanying liturgical furniture in the building in the centuries following the destruction of the Second Temple. The orientation of prayer toward Jerusalem originating in the legal or halachic stipulation appearing in Tanaic Midrash Sifre Deuteronomy 29 apparently influenced the design of many synagogues built in the third century onwards in ancient Palestine and diaspora. To date, not a single synagogue constructed between 150 and 250 CE has been found in the region although some finds may hint at their existence. Nevertheless, the building erected in the second half of the third century CE in Stratum 2b at Hamat Tiberias, at Engedi, at Churbat Hamam, which were all oriented toward Jerusalem, had no permanent Torah shrine. Only by the late third and mainly fourth century CE, with the introduction of a bima which appear on all the three uh, images at the bottom. Um, with the introduction of the Bima platform built into the prayer hall, the Torah shrine became a permanent fixture there, serving a visual focus indicating conclusively that the direction of prayer was towards Jerusalem. Architectural elements belonging to the Torah shrine found in the late 5th century synagogue at Um el Kanatir uh, in the Golan allowed archaeologists to reconstruct for the first time a five meter edicula or niche. Several architectural elements found elsewhere in the region suggest that similar facilitated, uh, facilities existed in other nearby synagogues. The Torah shrine in this synagogue built on a bima took the form of a dicula adorned with columns supporting a garble lintel, and in many ways it represents the facade of a Roman temple. The bima in other synagogues contained a less elaborate ark, but was enclosed by a chancel tree similar to the presbyterium in the church, which was formed by a row of marble columns and panels decorated with various low relief, and the one from a, a, a susia is a good example demonstrating this type of bimas. Three standing minarets made of marble 
or limestone adorn the synagogue at Chorvat Maon, Susia and Eshtamoa in southern Israel, and Chabad Tiberias in Galilee. The size, shape, and craftsmanship of these menorot differ in each side. But in the light of the common depiction in ancient Jewish art of architectural facade flanked by Jewish symbols, it is possible that at least one menorah actually stood near the Torah shrine in several ancient synagogues. At times, the menorah was used to illuminate the prayer hall, yet its location beside the Torah shrine in the direction of prayer, like the one in Maon, emphasizes the sanctification of the synagogue and seems to have symbolized the Jerusalem temple and the hope for future redemption for the local communities. Beside Jewish coinage, which I will not discuss in this lecture, the bulk of direct, uh, direct evidence pertaining to Jewish life in ancient times comes from, Jerusalem, from the, the Jewish necropolis and the ancient synagogues, which were the core of Sukhanic studies and still consider vibrant topics in current research. The abundance of archaeological finds uncovered over the last decades has generated much discussion, changed all perceptions, and opened new horizons in the study of Jewish material culture. Synagogue and necropolis are undoubtedly part and parcel of the study of Jewish archaeology, but quantities of substantial finds uncovered in the last decades of the 20th century and more recent have widened the scope of cultural markers for Jewish ethnic and religious identity. These are ritual baths, chuckstone vessels, and domestic ware found in private dwellings in both urban and rural contexts throughout the region that were used exclusively by Jews on daily basis, even though they do not feature clear Jewish symbols. The Jewish ritual of immersion in water to cleanse one's body is rooted in the Bible. However, in the course of the Second Temple period, and especially in the Hasmonean period, in the late second century BCE and onwards, there was an increased concern among the Jews of ancient Palestine to observe ritual purity. Immersion could be performed in natural source of water, a river, a spring, as we see over here, or a cistern. But from the late second century BC on, a special installation known as mikveh in Hebrew, or ritual bus, was set up for this purpose, primarily in private sphere. At a time, such installations were part of the bathhouse, close to wine or olive press, or even adjacent to uh, tombs. Over 850 ri such ritual baths are known to date in the region. Their distribution is not unique to the Jerusalem or associated only with priestly elite, but also, also fairly common in all Jewish circles in both Judea and the Galilee. Ritual baths vary in size and shape. They are mostly rectangular or square and large enough for a single individual of other size to immerse himself. While some of the ritual baths are especially small, like the one from Sepphoris, others are large and allow for a comfortable immersion. They were hewn into rock beneath floor levels and sometimes next to large water systems, and their walls were coated with several layers of thick gray plaster. One entered the ritual bath via steps that were sometimes narrow located on the sidewalk, like the one from Gamla. The difference in the ritual bath lay in the features of the circuits, whether straight or curved, in the number of the steps, and if they span the entire width of the pool. The step pool were most likely fed by steady water supply, either via gutters running from the buildings a uh, roof or via channels that drain the water from nearby areas. 
some of the ritual bath in Judea and Jerusalem, in contrast to their counterparts in the Galilee and the Golan, have two openings, an entryway and an exit, or a low partition, that's on the, uh, on the right, on the steps that separated the impure descending into the immersion pool and the pure emerging from it. Despite the differences between Judea and the Galilee, the step pool in both regions serve the same purpose, immersion and purification, and attest to how much ritual purity was widespread practice in Jewish circles. Vessels made from soft chuckstone were a significant part of Jewish material culture in Judea and the Galilee. Produced by and for the Jews, these vessels were found in those same densely populated Jewish towns, villages, and farms containing ritual baths. Beside the large chalice-shaped storage vessel, the Kalal, here on the left, the repertoire includes large quantities of mugs, bowls, various sized trays, jar lids, and small vessels for personal use. Five workshops manufactured store, uh, chuckstone vessels were operated around Jerusalem and two in the Lower Galilee. The Mount Scopus is north of the Hebrew University, and the one in Ariana is about five kilometers east of uh, Sepphoris. Additional quarries apparently operated in both regions to meet the local demand for such vessels. It is difficult to determine what the intended demand or purpose of these vessels was and what led for their production on such large scale in the late Second Temple period. Most scholars agree that the Jewish inhabitants of the mid or late first century BCE and onwards use such stone vessels owing to their concern for ritual purity. Since pottery vessel cannot be purified and stone vessel cannot be contaminated and remain pure. Some scholars link the production of Chuckstone vessel to the scrupulous observance of purity law and laws among priests, Pharisees, and, Qum and Qumran sectarians. Others argue that the observance of ritual purity is not necessarily connected to the temple cult in Jerusalem or to the priests, but reflect a widespread phenomena in which Jewish society throughout ancient Palestine adhered to the biblical law regarding purity regulations. One scholar maintained that Chuckstone vessels had very little to do with purity concerns and proposed that they were a spin-off of the in industry ba uh, based in the first century Jerusalem. Another examines the similarity between several stone vessels and luxurious uh, wear of non-Jews, and this uh, image compared the various vessels, maintaining that Jews prefer stone vessels of local production to the imported luxury wear out of a desire to reinforce their Jewish identity. At this stage of research, it is impossible to determine if the widespread use of stone vessels in the first century CE was for religious, national, or personal motives. However, the fact remains that the inventory of stone vessels attests to practices intended from the outset for the Jewish population. The past three decades have witnessed an explosion in a number of studies associated with the observance of ritual purity. And it is commonly assumed that ritual baths and chuckstone vessels are both material expressions of this practice. Most scholars agree that the use of ritual baths in Judea and Galilee that appeared by the late second century BCE and the Chuckstone vessels that were introduced several decades later actually continue until the Bar Kokhba revolt and were consequently phased out. At first glance, such a paradigm is compelling. However, it relies on the finds emerging for sites that were destroyed and totally abandoned in the course of the first and second revolts against Rome in Judea and the Galilee. 
the discovery of ritual bus or Chuckstone vessel at any other given site, a site, and let scholars to assume that they should be dated earlier and not later than 135 CE. In contrast, Sepharis and Betcharim continue to exist undamaged after the two revolts and throughout late antiquity, while the finds uncovered in those and other sites provide the opportunity to reassess earlier assumptions and to challenge accepted paradigms. Methodologically speaking, there is no reason to assume that the use of ritual bus and Chuckston vessels ceased in such locales following the two revolts as they did in the second temple sites. On the contrary, the finds uncovering Sepharis and Betcharim in the Galilee and Susa in Judea, as well as in other sites in both regions, may suggest that Jews, or at least several groups within the community, continued to observe the laws of ritual purity probably up to the early 4th century CE, and only then did this practice dwindle over time. Domestic ware are used for storage, cooking, food preparation, table and eating ware at times serve as a social markers of group's identity. But compared to other finds presented earlier, they are less definitive. Fine were pottery decorated with floral designs well known in the Negev and Arabia and is associated with the Nabataeans. That's on the left. <coughs> and the red slip uh, uh, table were known in literature as, uh, as Terra Sigillata A or Eastern Sigillata A was used, and that's on the right, were used mostly by non Jews with the Jews, owing to their anti Roman stance in the first century C largely avoided it. Otherwise, most of common pottery vessels that were used in daily basis and were produced by large quantities um, do not exhibit unique ethnic characteristics and therefore cannot be considered a conclusive ethnic market. In this respect, some clay vessels from the Galilee which was largely populated by Jews from late Second Temple period and throughout late antiquity are exceptions. Such vessels have been found since excavation began in the Galilee, but significant progress was made in their analysis as a unique group associated with Jewish circles only in the mid 1980s in conjunction with the increased number of excavations conducted in the region. Large quantities of clay pottery, especially cooking ware from Kfar Hanania and storage jars from Shechin, the two major Galilean workshops that produced goods primarily for the use of the Galilean Jews, and mentioned also in rabbinic literature as pottery manufacturing centers, are known in every stratum at every site in the region up to the early 5th century CE. Located on the border between Upper and Lower Galilee, several kilns and massive amounts of waste product were uncovered three decades ago by David Adan Bayevitz at Kfar Hanania. However, the manufacturing site at Shechin had not yet been found. Only recently, the kiln, that's on the left, upper left, 33 fragments of uh, lamp mold, uh, on the right, over 1,400 lamp fragments have been found by James Riley Strange at Shechin, suggesting that large numbers of oil lamps were produced there in the first and second century CE. The wide distribution in the Galilee of Fahananya and Shechin pottery, as well as those oil lamps, is unique in Decatur of the local Jewish population preference for vessels produced by local Jewish craftsmen over those manufactured by non-Jews outside the region. Whether because of religious, nationalistic, or economic motives, this vessel may serve as yet another cultural marker of the ethnic identity and behavioral patterns of Galilean Jewry in the first centuries of the Common Era. In conclusion, 
large-scale excavations and survey conducted in Israel during the last decades of the 20th century and until today have yielded abundant information on Jewish life in ancient Palestine. These finds, some of which carry distinctly Jewish markers and others whose external signs are less pronounced, contribute significantly to the fields in which Sukhanix was engaged and continue to expand the range of cultural markers in Jewish ethnic and religious identity. While archaeology by its very nature focuses on buildings and material finds, shedding light on the daily life and cultural behavior of Jewish populations in late antiquity, historians and archaeologists also make extensive use of Jewish literary sources, as Sukhanik did, to provide, supplement, or corroborate information concerning the realia of late antiquity. In their effort to contextualize Jewish daily life in late antiquity, modern scholarship is now also facilitated by the publication of critical edition of forbidden compilations and Greenisa fragments, as well as by new methods for examining this literature. While the innovations that were introduced in one custom or another in the course of late antiquity an in-depth examination of the finds suggests that the local population kept a homogeneous Jewish identity. Certain elements, whether ritual baths or soft limestone vessels for purification, or the existence of a synagogue in a city or a village for congregating on Sabbath, festivals, or weekly prayer, or to read or study the scriptures, were meant to fill a personal a communal need required to maintain Jewish lifestyle. Other matters relating to daily life in the private realm, such as burial tombs, cooking vessels, and storage jars, and other utensils, re reflect prevalent Jewish practices that did not necessarily come from their religious need or halachic legal requirements. The bulk of evidence I have presented tonight is Jewish in nature and attests to the religious, ethnic, cultural, and social identity of Jewish population in the periods under discussion. In my third and final lecture next week, I will focus on a, on a range of finds associated with the Greco-Roman lifestyle and culture, and then offer insights into contextualizing Jewish life in ancient Palestine. This will allow us to question the limits, shifting borders, and extent to which Jewish communities in the region were open to adopting foreign influences and assimilating them into their lives. Thank you. So we have uh, uh, some time for questions. And while, while you're thinking of all the good questions, I want to ask a very simple one. And that is, the way you've laid this out in terms of continuing Sukhanik's themes and what he thought of as Jewish archaeology, um, how would you characterize the, the prevalence, the preponderance of this approach in terms of the history of, uh, of archaeology as it's been practiced in the modern state of Israel? The, numbers of digs focusing on this, the publications on these areas, is this a kind of majority practice, or have you emphasized these strands? But in fact, if we stood further back, they would appear as a small concern against the backdrop of, of archaeology in the last uh, 50 or 60 years. That's the best question. And in preparing the lecture, I was debating, I there's a story behind the three lectures, and there's a connection be be between the, the three of them. And the main purpose is really to give an overview on a field of research. I don't think that this lecture emphasized the clear connection between Sukhanic legacy and the research that was conducted in the last 20, in, in the last decades of the 20th century or until today. I don't think Sukhanic is standing. Of every, every excavation, but 
I think that when you, and, and that, that will become even more evident in my next lecture when I really break the borders. But if you ask anybody who's spinning and who's working in the field and asking what is Jewish archaeology, immediately would tell you synagogues and, and necropolis and inscriptions and coinage. I mean, I couldn't go over everything. But I, I don't think that everything is, is in, 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 the, in the footsteps of Sukhani. But there's no doubt that those fields of knowledge are really the focus of, of, of the field. And uh, I think if you, if, even if you go backwards and, and look like in a larger overview, I still think that there's a lot of emphasis uh, on synagogues, and there's a lot of emphasis I mean, less on necropolis. <coughs> and then the other artifacts are being integrated into the larger picture. So I, I, see, I think today when we talk about Jewish archaeology, it's completely different from what Stephanie saw in, in his eyes in many ways. Can I answer that question? Mary? I have a, just a question about the chalk vessels in particular. This is a small question. Um, is there something in the properties of chalk vessels, a functional property, that would um, make it more desirable for a particular kind of use than, than, than pottery, than ceramics? that might not be related to ritual and law, but kind of a functional I, application. I, that's some of the arguments that other people who are not connected the chalks and beds of the purity levels. I mean, if you ever touch the, those chalks, they are very fine. Mm -hmm. and some of them are really high quality. And some people argue that they are so, I mean, the collab or, or another one, two bezels. I think there's no question about it, but they are some way connected with purity law. But the majority of, 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 uh, of bezels are really fine work, and, uh, and according to those uh, people, and I tend to agree with them, especially once you hold those bezels, they might be um, special vessels, the serving pieces, uh, to put on, on the houses of the wealthy. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, where you compare, for example, I mean, a skifos, a, 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 a silver skifos with nice decoration is very nice. But when you hold a nice uh, um, um, goblet or cup or a plate made out of, uh, of uh, um, chalkstone, they're fine work. Mm -hmm. And it might be that People really want to use them in their home as a fine work. Sure. I, I had a kind of interesting thought. So many, you talk about a hundred synagogues that have been discovered in the last couple of years. What is your I sense? You say that hundreds were discovered in the last No, 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 that they're, they're found, that they've been, been found. found. Excuse yes. me, excuse me, yes, no, I did hear that. Um, what's your sense about what is is still out there? Do you have, can you, can you <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm sense? telling my students. Yes? We're dealing with fractions mm -hmm. of evidence. Oh. I think there are, I mean, in surface, people can assign you other synagogues. I think there are more synagogues. To be fair. I think, yeah. But we have to have patience. And I don't think that we'll ever be able to uncover everything. But I mean the Hercules mosaic that they found last summer or two summers ago. I mean they're just it's, Samson rather. I mean, it's, it's, a, yeah, I mean the Hukok mosaic right, I guess show it's Johnny Magnus excavations. It's spectacular. I remember when I excavated the one in Sephoris, which I believe some of you know, we thought it's spectacular and this is like the end of the <laughs> Of findings, and then coming Chovat Chama, and now for Kok. <coughs> I think this, I think we we are more fun to be had. More and more. Yes. Shall we? Yeah. Is there any evidence that some of these vessels were used in terms of dietary function? Because of some of the it's, it's it's really a good question. I think now with new uh, methods. Sciences, I mean, there's good options to uh, find uh, further evidence regarding the dietary or what they exactly use in those vessels. And I think there are already a few studies yeah. that 
referring or dealing to this uh, to this issue, but in order to have good results, you have to take the vessels in, immediately after it's been excavated and send it to the laboratory, yeah, exactly. and then get the information. <laughs> Unfortunately, in the past, and I know that I know, and, and, and many other archaeologists did that in the past, after they excavated the vessels, they want to see it, so they washed it. Yes. <laughs> Once you wash it, it's over. Yes. <laughs> so today, with the new techniques, I mean, there is yeah. so I'm sure that we many people uh, will do that and will get for the results. And it's true also not only for the chucks and vessels, it's true also for the pottery. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular reason a beautiful mosaic would become a floor rather than on the wall? Uh, are, are there any special reasons for this? It's, you know, it's a very good question. I was yesterday, I told you, if you share with my experience yesterday, I met yesterday with the associate curator of the Met. And it's spoke about all sorts of things, and at one point she told me, I want to consult you with um, the Metro uh, acquired a few years ago a piece of fabric with the uh, depictions which might be connected with the story of crossing the sea by the Israelites. And the conversation went on, and this issue was raised. I mean, could it be possible that walls were also decorated, like the Dora Rotus, for example, either with the frescoes or with a piece of cloth, which had all sorts of decorations? And although the Dora Rotus, for the moment, is the only example where you have wall paintings with biblical depictions, I would assume, and I also argue, articles of mine that it's also possible that several synagogues in ancient Palestine were also decorated with wall paintings containing uh, containing uh, uh, all sorts of scenes including biblical scenes but in course of our discussion yesterday it really came up as an option that it might be that in some places instead of having an artist drawing on the wall they bought a piece of tapestry or piece of cloth with uh, such decorations and hang it on the wall, or if they use it as a, a kind of a, of a screen between spaces. So it could be that some of the depictions were also on walls. But unfortunately, until today, the only evidence in Palestine is coming for floor mosaics. Um, yes, sir, um, obviously, Rome had a spectacularly detailed, extensive mosaic tradition of its own. Is it, was there any cross-pollinization between what the Jews were doing and what was going on with the Romans? Uh, that's, a, that's a course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to answer it. Anything that the Jews were doing in terms of art and also architecture as correlation and connection with the outside world, be it Roman or Christian. And therefore, also in mosaic art, it didn't happen in a vacuum. They used all sorts of comparison, parallels, methods, etc., coming from the outside. So uh, when you ask the question, what is Jewish about Jewish art, this is one of them. Good thing. Me? No, behind you. Oh, if I could just follow up on that. I noticed when the Jonah mosaic was shown that there were these funny little figures up in the upper left part, and I realized they were the sirens, and they've, they've been inspired in making the Jonah image by the story of Odysseus, or Ulysses, uh, who has himself... Um, uh, tied to the mast so that he's not seduced by the beautiful singing of the sirens. So there's a, there are a lot of connections. I mean, that was a very direct one. And uh, this is uh, actually this mosaic was recently published by Jody Magnus and her mosaic, mosaic specialist, Karen Bree, on Pacer, and that's the way they interpreted it. And it's completely uh, reflected what I, I, I mean, what I answered. 
Yeah. So you are. Of course, pollinization. Um, I had a question about the chalkware. Um, do you think that they, one, that at some point they had color introduced to them? And then the other is, I know that from some of the early jugs, there were imprints, they, were, they impressed uh, names, this is my jug, uh -huh. <laughs> with certain names or whatever, because they would use them in the daily storage jugs, for instance, the storage jugs. So I'm wondering, did you find any uh, writing name, any, do you, or do you expect to find at some point with the chalkware some kind of impression or writing, let a, I don't think there'd be any kind of drawings or any illustration on them, because for a variety of reasons, obviously. But I just wondered if there were, that might give some clues to things, if there were some. No, it is no way, I mean, the chunks of vessels actually decorated with simple uh, incise lines or profiles, right. but they were never painted. As far as we know, and there's no sign, I mean, no, no signature of artists, nothing. They, they, were, they were, I mean, according to what we know, I mean, the, the reconstruction of their um, uh, method of, uh, in, uh, of um, and th they were produced in, in quarries. They had a simple machine, a latte, which they, or even in hand, and they're manufactured by simple artists. So in what makes those vessels very, I mean, especially I think the fact that they are really smooth. But other than that, they were not decorated at all. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for this. I didn't mean to ask this question, but you did mention the fact that everything is related and everything is connected. And, you know, um, the Sukhenik project is very much about Jewish archaeology. The Yadin project is very much a, was very much a nationalistic Israeli project. Um, and I wonder you on the 21st century, looking backward, to what extent can you actually separate these objects as being part of Jewish material culture that is distinct from everything else that is around it, and to what extent these objects are actually shared by more, more than one religion, especially the structures. So I wonder if everything is connected, <laughs> then to what extent we can actually talk about these things as distinctively Jewish? Uh, I don't exactly understand what you mean, uh, connected. I mean, those are finds, I mean, the synagogues and necropolis and evidence for Jewish usage. Once you have inscriptions, and that's make the connection. And then the the art, I mean the ritual bars and the chunks and vessels were found mainly. I mean ritual far and ritual bars you won't find in non-Jewish areas. That's for sure, definitely. So that's also connected with Jewish realm. And then when you go with Jackson vessels, the majority, the majority of vessels, again, was found in those uh, in settlements that are connected with the Jews. It's true. For example, I have a friend who excavated in, in Gerasa in Jordan, and he found one vessel. I'm not saying that, they, I mean, that some, very few Jackson vessels travel, either through uh, transaction, uh, I don't know, people move from one place to another place, but the majority of vessels are found in sites that are populated by, by Jews. I mean, the less, I mean, the pottery is less exclusive. I mean, the pottery is more, I mean, because pottery, the range of pottery and the distribution, it's in larger borders. So that's why I put it there. And I think I, I'm, I'm personally hesitating about the, the pottery. Um, so, I, 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 the question I ask myself I'm th I'm, I, in terms of material culture, how can I identify a community? Mm -hmm. That's the main question. And I'm not saying that the community did not share all sorts of artifacts with the uh, other community. And I will be the last to deny it. And next lecture will present my observation on the topic. I, th I think things are more lucid, but that within this realm, the definite, I mean, the seven artifacts are definitely 
we're, we're, we're youth, definitely Jewish, uh, by, by the Jewish community. That, that, that's why I, I do think that you can, to a certain extent, re, a, 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 create or, 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 or present a kind of overall picture which characterizes the community mm -hmm. in certain periods. But if I could just re-ask Itai's question, I mean, in a way, maybe it's the way archaeology functions, but it seems as if there's a, um, a circularity involved, right? There's the prior sense, I mean, in a way, the whole presentation is an archaeologist's answer to the question of who is a Jew, right? The a Jewish no, object. I didn't, no, 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 but exactly. <laughs> but, but my point is that Sukhanik, who studied in yeshiva as a child, may have brought with him into the field this notion that a Jewish object can only be identified through what we know of ritual practice, right? So something like a house, I mean, there's no Jewish house in the literature because how would you ritually mark a Jewish house? So the question is how this influence <coughs> shapes the identification of Jewish culture as it was lived if the only parts that the archaeologists will identify as Jewish are those that would mark ritual practice. It sort of identifies in advance what is Jewish and then looks for it. It's, that's the main problem. I mean, I think that's the main problem. What make Jewish artifacts Jewish? Uh, and, and whether uh, those artifacts indicate a Jewish practice. It's, that's the main question. So I, I, I don't know, I, I think that uh, in a way, I don't see it as a circular argument. I don't think, I, I think that in certain ways, there are parameters that defining uh, uh, um, Jewish usage. I mean, there's no way you can say synagogue is used by other communities. And, uh, and then you go on to the, to the, other, to the other evidence. So, uh, I mean, in, in, in the five, in, uh, let's say, in the four group of evidence that I presented tonight, uh, I, I mean, beyond the problem, I feel comfortable, and I don't think it's circumstantial. I, I think it's clear evidence that indicating Jewish usage and Jewish practice. Uh, I think it's becoming more complicated when you open the borders. Right. And then you go back to the question, I, I look, you know, I'm excavating a house. The Jewish house itself. I mean, there's nothing in the house and not in the walls, not in the construction, not in the foundation, not in the floor, nothing there but saying I'm Jewish, unless you have a rich bus. But what's about animal bones? Pigs? Yeah, but that's that's kind of, that's always the question of whether you find it in situ or just in accumulations. I know there's a tendency, you know, one of my colleagues, Eric Myers, who used to work in Central, is always coming. And saying here, I have a layer with a, I have a pit with uh, with the pig bones, and those pig bones indicating a change of, uh, of, of 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 communities. And I told him it's it's a pit. I mean, it's it's a it's a water system. People throw there all sorts of things. I don't think you can really study from them unless unless you find a kitchen with remains or depository of clear uh, uh, pig bones. But otherwise, pig bones found. I always bring the example, and when I work on the synagogue in Sepphoris, and we analyze the bones that were found in the synagogue building, there are plenty of pig bones. Hmm. So what do you do with that information? I mean, can you relate it to the synagogue? Or maybe it's just accumulation that somehow appear on, 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 on the remains of the building after it was abandoned and destroyed. I, th I think it's, I mean, context, that's the, main, that's the word that you take into consideration. What is the context of the find? Whether it's coming in situ and you can really prove connection between the, the architectural layout and the finds, or whether it's just things that rumble around the sides. And I think that's a problem. I just wanted to say that there's something very poignant about, in terms of identifying, uh, identifying something Jewish, for, for any Jew, whether they were living in the Middle Ages or today, if they were in Czechoslovakia uh, in the 17th century or 16th century, the designs, many of the designs are still there. 
their, their ritual designs maintain over many, many centuries. And some of the things that you see here, you could see painted on the walls in a way in Czechoslovakia. It's one of the synagogues that was uh, recently in the news. Yeah, that made me think of that. So that we would, but in other words, you would be able to identify this as very much Jewish. And I think that's very poignant and very beautiful. So in our context, I think now is the time to stop the formal part uh, of the evening. I welcome all of you to linger over a glass of wine and some food. Um, and I hope to see you back next week. But before we all go, uh, a fond farewell and thank you. For